Hello and welcome to Telecom TV and to the great Telco debate 2022. I'm talking with Sanjay Uppal of VMware. Sanjay, welcome. Nice to talk to you. Martin, very nice to see you again. You too. Let's get straight into it. We've heard a lot about the journey of CSP to DSP. It's taking a while. Um, as far as VMware is concerned, what is your understanding of what a DSP actually is? Right. So, you know, a lot of the communication service providers or telcos now think of themselves as techcos, technology companies. And the reason that they're doing this is because the services that they provide, they need to get a lot closer to where either consumers or businesses are thinking of it in the context of an application. So a digital service provider, which is what DSP stands for, or techco, is really talking to consumers or businesses in the context of the applications they want to consume rather than the networking that goes into it. Very succinct. So can you tell us in a bit more detail what the characteristics are or the differences between a CSP and a DSP when it comes to practicalities? Right. So communication service providers, we always think of it in terms of the bits and bytes. How many megabits per second are you getting? How much are you paying for it? You know, where are the locations? What kind of devices you get it from? But when you talk about a digital service provider, it's in the context of the application you want to access. As an example, there's all this talk about the metaverse these days. So what does your metaverse experience look like? Or let's say that you're going to watch, uh, of course, there's a World Cup going on right now. Let's say you're going to watch a World Cup game. How good is the experience of the streaming that you're doing? Because all the millennials, they don't just want to go watch the game. They want to watch the game and show everyone else that they're at the game watching it. So what's the experience of the streaming service that you get when you're watching the game? It's not about the bits and bytes. It's about the digital experience you get by using the bits and bytes. So that's the difference. The CSP talks much more in the context of communications. The DSP talks much more in the context of the digital services that are provided on top of the communications. How far along the journey are most CSPs into becoming DSPs? Yeah, so I would say that the entire industry is more at the starting line than at the finishing line. There are, of course, some of them who are a little bit ahead than the others. And these tend to be some of the smaller players, more of the greenfield opportunities that come in. An example of this would be Dish Networks in the United States, which is our fourth carrier that are launching a greenfield 5G network from scratch. So those are the kinds of people who would be further ahead. Of course, some of the larger telecom operators as well, Vodafone as, a, as an example, Telecom Italia, Telefonica, AT&T, all of these folks do have digital services that, they are, that they've launched. But they have the legacy to deal with as well. They can't go as fast as a smaller operator that doesn't have the legacy to go with. But we're still closer to the starting line, I would say, than to the finishing line. So how far to the finishing line? Ah, that's the $64 million question or billion dollar question, isn't it? You know, telecom technologies and services don't change very often. And so the finishing line would be when there's true network on demand. That's the nirvana or the end stage that all of us networking geeks like to talk about. And I think that's going to take a while, I would say at least five years for us to start seeing um, networking on demand in, in, a, in a fairly major way. Thank you. Can we move on to talk about another technology? What progress are you seeing uh, at VMware in the development and deployment of Open RAN? It's in the news all the time. And in particular in this question, the ability for the ecosystem to build scalable solutions. Now, you know, it's really good to have controversial topics in the industry. One of them definitely is Open RAN. It's attracted so much of interest. And the reason it's attracted interest is because there's a seismic shift that is going on between the proprietary technologies that uh, were built into telecom networks and this new type of technology that is really coming in much more from the computer industry. So the computer industry is used to disaggregated solutions, which is really what Open RAN is all about. It's about disaggregating the current way that telecom networks are built and doing it in a way that is open. Now, open means that you can have different building blocks of the network contributed to by different vendors, but you still piece them together and make it look like one solution. And the reason that that is important when you, when you disaggregate it is that each building block can be built by a different company. Typically, a group of startups will get together. They'll innovate on top of abstraction layers or interfaces that are built. And then the entire solution moves forward much faster than if you, were build, if you build a proprietary solution. But of course, there's a debate going on. And the debate is, well, is OpenRAN going to 
come in and take over? Is it not? How fast is it going to happen? And who are the winners and losers? We're coming towards the end of 2022, and many people around the world will be saying thank God for that. But uh, <laughs> yes. So as we move on into 23 and moving towards the, the middle of the decade, um, I want you to look forward, if you would. It's a dangerous thing to do, but look, looking forward a year or two years or so, what sort of a position do you think telcos will be in to capitalise on the service opportunities that are coming up? And what will that landscape by, let's say, 2025 actually be like, do you think? Yeah, so there's actually a lot of trials going on right now and some deployments of Open RAN. And so from a wireless network standpoint, I do expect that the level of disaggregation in the middle of the decade will be a lot, will be a lot along compared to what it is right now. And also coming with that will be programmability. So one of the things that Open RAN promises is not just faster speed and lower latency and the usual things that we talk about, but it's really programmability of the network. Just take this example. Let's say that again, you're at a FIFA World Cup and you know, you've know you paid, let's say a few thousand pounds, maybe a thousand pounds to watch the final game. Would you pay another 50 pounds or so to be able to stream that game to all of the people in 4K, right? So, you know, we think yes, but the level of programmability is not there. There's no tariff to say that if you paid another 50 pounds that you'd be able to stream this game in pristine quality. That requires business tariff, that requires technology called network slicing, it requires programmability of the network, and this is all to satisfy the millennials that are coming in that hopefully will be able to open their wallets. So I think by the middle of the decade, you're going to see examples of this happening around the world, and some of the more forward-leaning operators who are already in trials and some deployments today are going to be the ones to win. So, of course, you've got to have the risk-taking ability to move in that direction. But, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that Open RAN will happen and the network interfaces will open up, programmability will come in, and then you and I will be looking at networking on demand in a few years from now. Time will tell. We'll find out. Really interesting interview. Sanjay Opal, thanks very much. Indeed. Thank you, Martin.